So now let's look at nursing practice to facilitate optimal patient outcomes. First of all, we wanna know what the goals of care for the patient are. This should be assessed on admission and then reevaluated routinely. You know, is the patient improving or declining? What is the prognosis? And the prognosis may be aided by the use of, again, the SOFA tool or the Apache 2 score. Sometimes the patient's wishes are over, overshadowed by emotions and the desire of the family. Although we need to be sensitive to the family's mental and emotional state of mind, we need to be an advocate for the patient. So did the patient make their wishes well known? Do they have advanced directives? Do they have a po post form? In Indiana, we have a provider order for sustaining therapy or for scope of treatment that looks at, does the patient want CPR or do they not want CPR? If they don't want CPR, what, how aggressive do they want us to be? What therapies do they want us to uh, enact? Also, have they had a discussion with family members or a healthcare representative? It's important to know what the patient's wishes are so we can fulfill them. So what about nursing interventions? These interventions are all routine interventions that we should be implementing in our practice before COVID-19. But how have we adapted these routine interventions or adjusted them in the face of this global pandemic? So delirium first. Um, the first thing you wanna do for delirium is assess for delirium on a shift to shift basis. If you're not currently assessing delirium in your med surge units, as well as your critical care units, you may be missing this disease. And, um, and it's important to early identify the disease so you can intervene um, quickly and give the patients the treatment that they need. However, the treatment to prevent and treat uh, delirium is common for all of our patients. Looking at cognitive stimulating activities, optimizing the sleep-wake cycle, using the aids of hearing aids or eyeglasses, mobility, hydration, pain management. All these therapies should be given to all of our patients. There's a lot of research on delirium treatment and prevention, and it's a multi-component multi intervention that we use. The innovative tool that we use in COVID-19 is our personal approach form here at Indiana University Health Bloomington Hospital. We developed this personal approach form years ago, and we have had um, some success with implementing the tool. But with COVID-19, we found that more and more patients were developing delirium. So we started using this tool more often. And what the tool does is it understands the patient as a person. So we look at questions and we sit down with family members and we discuss the, the, the patient's um, importance of their life, their hobbies, their activities, who is important in their life and their names. Do they have pets? Uh, what was their occupation or are they still working? Um, what's their daily routine? And what therapies seem to promote calmness and what agitates the patient. This is extremely important in people that are experiencing dementia. And many times caregivers understand what will help calm the individual and what may agitate them. Extremely important information as we care for these patients that may be experiencing delirium on top of dementia. I've used this tool as I consult with patients and their family members when they're experiencing delirium. Jack was an example of a patient that would be very agitated early in the morning. As I went through the, the personal approach form with Jack's wife, she explained to me that his daily routine, routine was when he woke up, he would get out of bed, he'd drink a cup of coffee and he'd read the paper. So when Jack had exhibited agitation first thing in the morning, we got him out of the bed, we got him in a chair, uh, we got him a cup of coffee and his wife read the paper to him. It really helped calm him down. So we print this form off and we put it at the bedside so that other healthcare uh, providers can come in and understand the patient as a person and understand who they are. 
in the midst of COVID crisis, the COVID crisis, we recognize that patients in isolation were exhibiting more symptoms of delirium. So we came together as a group in a system-wide meeting and, and looked at how we could improve the care of these individuals. Our social workers who are no longer going to the bedside uh, to decrease exposure decided they wanted to be a part of this and they wanted to call families and fill out this personal approach form. Our IT department made it a, per, uh, made it a form in our EMR, so it's easy to complete and easy to locate. We know that progressive mobility is the most effective intervention to pre prevent delirium and treat delirium. This is our progressive mobility protocol and it was developed by myself and a group of other clinical nurse specialists and has been implemented throughout our entire IU health system in all of our facilities. We know that progressive mobility can not only prevent and treat delirium, but it's also very important in preventing de deconditioning of our patients. There's multiple studies uh, illustrating the benefits of progressive mobility. So this progressive mobility protocol has the levels listed at the top, as well as the descriptor of the levels in the box below the levels. Our goal each shift is to progress the patient to the next level. If we're unable to do that, we elicit the help of our a physical therapist and occupational therapist to use their expertise in helping us to advance the patient to the next level. We also, at the bottom of the uh, protocol, have tools to aid the nurse in the progression from one level to the next. So in the boxes near the bottom, it tells the nurse what the patient has to perform before they can safely move to the next level. During the COVID crisis, our physical therapist and occupational therapist said that they wanted to continue to participate in the care of patients regardless of their COVID status. And this has been beneficial in the care of our patients. It's also been a challenge trying to mobilize patients in extreme isolation. One facility, Parkview Health in Fort Wayne, Indiana, took displaced physical therapists and occupational therapists from ambulatory settings and they formed mobility teams to, to increase their progressive mobility. Now they haven't, they submitted their data for publication. So this is unpublished data from their CNS team. But what they found was an increased number of mobility recessions, increased progression of the level of the patients, decreased transfer to the ICU, decreased hospital length of stay, as well as an increased discharge to home, as opposed to an extended care facility or an EC or a rehab facility. But I wanna highlight that middle bullet statement that it decreased transfers to the ICU. This intervention may help slow or stop the progression of the disease. So oxygenation, monitoring, closely monitoring the oxygen status of the patients is extremely important, but then intervening and providing supplemental oxygen to patients as they need it is important. The NIH in their guidelines recommend to get, go ahead and start supplemental oxygen. And then, then if they exhibit persistent hypoxia, then to move to a high flow nasal cannula before moving to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation because of the aerosolization that you exhibit with non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. And then if the patient needs to uh, progress, move them to mechanical ventilation. But again, can we intervene early to prevent the progression of their oxygen status and the need for high flow nasal cannula or mechanical ventilation? I think we can, and I think there's, there's nursing interventions that can help with this. Along with progressive mobility, prone positioning has been shown to be of a benefit with patients with deteriorating respiratory status. So again, the NIH recommends for patients with persistent um, hypoxia, uh, despite supplemental oxygen, to go ahead and start prone positioning, or what they call awake proning. It's not considered 
uh, you know, a last resort, trying to prevent the patient from intubation by proning them. This should be started early and should be a thoughtful process. For patients that progress in their disease process and require mechanical ventilation, the recommendation is to prone them for up to 16 hours a day. So with prone positioning, most of the research has come from mechanically ventilated patients exhibiting acute respiratory distress syndrome. A well-known study called the PROCEVA trial demonstrated that proning ventilated patients improved their oxygenation and, and improved their mortality. But what about non-ventilated patients? Will they show the same improvements? We've seen improvement with our awake proning patients. What we've seen is an increase in secretion clearance as this fluid that's pooled in the lungs comes out of the patient in the in this prone position. We've seen recruitment of the posterior lung regions and improved ventilator perfusion mismatch. And what's going on with those patients in the in the picture to the right, you see a patient in the supine position and with gravity that fluid pools in the posterior surfaces of the lungs, collapsing those alveoli. Along with that, the gravitational perfusion goes to that posterior section of the lungs where those alveoli are already collapsed. So you're getting perfusion to lungs, uh, lung fields that aren't open. Therefore, turning the patient over on their belly in the, in the prone position can help facilitate opening those collapsed alveoli in the posterior regions of the lung while perfusing the anterior portion of the lung where the alveoli are already open. What we do is we support the pelvis and the chest area of the patient, allowing the abdomen to hang freely. By allowing the abdomen to hang freely, what that facilitates is a better expansion of the diaphragm and therefore expansion of the lungs. This algorithm comes from a study out of China where they looked at two different provinces in China. These two provinces had dramatically different mortality rates. The province that was doing well with their mortality were also showed early recognition as well as early intervention using an algorithm that you see here where they screened patients uh, using the tools, using the criteria that you see before you High-risk patients, they monitor more frequently. Lower-risk individuals, they continue to monitor, but not as frequently. And then they looked for increased respiratory rate, decreased oxygen saturation, or the increase in supplemental oxygen, as well as an increased heart rate. And when they found that the patients started deteriorating, they quickly moved them to a higher level of care. And that higher level of care involved non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, or high-flow nasal cannula, restrictive fluid resuscitation, and prone position, awake prone positioning. If the patient continued to deteriorate, requiring mechanical ventilation, then they prone the patient for at least 16 hours um, in the prone position. Now, we recommend to start proning, or start proning therapy early in the process. When the patient first bits, gets put on supplemental oxygen, go ahead and prone them. The risk, um, the benefits certainly outweigh the risk, but you need to do it safely. So what, what I developed was standard work for pr awake proning of patients. Patients that are on just simple nasal cannula oxygen and that can turn themselves, it's easier and less risk but those patients that need extra help, maybe on BiPAP or CPAP or high flow nasal cannula, may need assistance as they turn into the prone position. This is where we wanna make sure that we keep the patient safe, healthcare workers safe, so that they're not injuring themselves and make sure that we're not accidentally pulling out tubes or IV lines as we flip them over on their, onto their belly. So this standard work aids the nurse in, in caring for that patient and turning them over successfully and including pictures to help them um, do it safely. So Parkview Health, again, studied their results. 
they started proning, uh, doing awake proning. And this study is a descriptive study uh, that they submitted for a publication. And out of 46 patients, they looked at 100 proning episodes. The average time that they kept the patient in the prone position was two hours. And what they did, what they found was an increased oxygenation, no complication or adverse events, no one got injured and no lines got pulled. But what they also found would, were that 43 of the 46 patients were able to be maintained out in the medical surgical unit. Only three patients transferred to the ICU, and of those three patients, only one required mechanical ventilation. Also, the majority of these patients were able to be safely discharged home as opposed to a rehab facility. So again, that middle bullet where 43 of the 46 patients were able to be maintained in medical surgical environment leads me to believe that these nursing interventions may slow the progression of the disease and may stop it from progressing to severe and critical illness. What about nutrition? Nutrition is important and we know that. The Society of Critical Care Medicine and the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition came out with guidelines in the face of COVID-19. Their guidelines continue to support early implementation of enteral nutrition for patients that require it. Um, and the importance of feeding, especially with a high protein supplement. But they also warned us to proceed with caution with those critically ill patients, which is no different than we currently do. The difference with, the, with their recommendation is if they already had an oral or a nasal gastric large bore feeding tube, to leave that in place and feed through that tube, as opposed to replacing it with a small bore feeding tube. They also recommended using a small bore feeding tube, placing the tip in, in the stomach, as opposed to advancing it into the small intestine. The reason they came out with these recommendations were they didn't want to increase exposure by moving the patient down to the interventional radiology suite to advance this tube into the small intestine. They also want to decre decrease the time it takes uh, to place the, the tube into the small intestine. Um, and they were worried about coughing as they advanced the tube in the small bowel. But what I found in my practice is that we use electromagnetic placement devices to place feeding tubes. The placing the, advancing the tube through the stomach into the small intestine does not take a significant amount of time longer than placing it in the stomach. We've also, I've also found that the most of the coughing and, and aerosolization of the disease happens when you hit the oral pharynx, not when you're down in the stomach. Also, our facility, as well as other facilities throughout the country, have eliminated x-rays for small bowel feeding tube placement. This decreases exposure to our radiologic technologist. But you need to determine what's best and what makes sense in your facility and use your judgment to determine where the best place to place the feeding tube for your patients. But do consider early initiation of nutrition.